Hi everyone and welcome back to the George Collection. I am Rachel with Right Side Blonde. Today I'm going to bring you the November of 1997 cover and this one I thought was very interesting because it has Diana on it, it has Roseanne, it has Michael Jackson, um, Barbara Walters. So this one was an easy pick for me just because of who was featured on the front. This week I thought it would be fun to tie in the Tiffany Blue episode from last week, which if you haven't seen that one, go back and watch it. That's episode 12. This is episode 13. I thought I would tie in the Tiffany Blue from last week to this week because, ironically, Diana was in my last episode and she pops up in this one again and lo and behold she's in Tiffany Blue in this magazine as well. Before we get into the article section, I wanted to show you all something I found this week. I don't know about you, but I've always wondered why the G and the E in George are connected. I've also wondered why the capital G is the same size as the E in all the other lowercase letters. Being the curious person I am, I started looking into symbolism and I found a symbol in astrology that looks rather similar to this symbol if you were to take out the middle line of the E. Prior to finding this symbol, I found a similar one that has to do with electrical currents and after reading about electrical currents for about 15 minutes, I decided this is gibberish to me. I don't think this is what JFK Jr. was going for, so I'm gonna keep looking. So if, if that's what it was, you all can do your research on it and decide for yourself what you think. What I came to decide was that it looks closest to the opposition astrology symbol. Of course I had to look it up because I'm not an astrologist, but this is what it says about opposition. The opposition is when planets are across the zodiac wheel from each other. It's a challenging or hard aspect because their energies are at odds. This means they're 180 degrees apart and the pairing is known as a polarity. It also says that oppositions are two signs and they are directly opposed to each other. Okay, so of course I had to look up some birthdays. John F. Kennedy Jr.'s birthday was November 25th. November 25th's zodiac sign is a Sagittarius. Then I decided to look up a certain George's birthday, and I think you know I'm not talking about George Washington. And his birthday was June 12th. June 12th is a Gemini. So then I just typed in opposition for Gemini. And lo and behold, Gemini and Sagittarius are direct opposites on the zodiac wheel. Another thing I found interesting in this magazine is that there were five watch advertisements. Five. If you look at the time on each of these watches and each of these advertisements, they're all around 10, 10. Well, of course I had to look up why this is, and it turns out that there's no special reason other than that it looks best on a watch when they're trying to advertise it. So it's perfectly symmetrical, and in some cases it looks like a smiley face, it looks like it's smiling. So they set these watches at 10, 10, and then photograph them for the advertisements. In one of the watch advertisements, the time seems to be less than 10, 10. It seems to be close to the time of a certain watch that I think you all know which watch I'm talking about. Now on the right side of the page is the watch advertisement. On the left side of the page is John Kennedy Jr.'s editor's letter. So this watch advertisement seems to be highlighted compared to the other four. And interestingly enough, it says it's about time. I enjoy a good play on words, so this was interesting. It's about time. Obviously that's just a phrase. It's about time. But is it also trying to tell us something? It's about time. Time in Gematria is 47. John is 47. I've learned a lot of times things have double meanings. Obviously that goes into the deniability aspect that I talked about in the last episode. So you have to keep an open mind when you read things and when you see things. Of course it could just be nothing, but it could also mean something. So keep your eyes and ears open when you are researching because you might just be missing some really important pieces of information. I don't know. What do you guys think? Put it in the comments. Let's get into the articles of this George magazine. I'd like to start with the editor's letter. In this editor's letter, John Kennedy Jr. talks about Mother Teresa and Princess Diana, and that Tiffany blue color comes into play again in this article. He begins, As I write this, it has seemed like a month of funerals, and the outpouring of raw feeling has the cynics squirming like salt bugs after a spring rain. Princess Diana, Mother Teresa, even broken President Mobutu, seem to reveal themselves as much in death as in life. A few contrarians are finding fault with Mother Teresa now that she's in a pine box. How better to display independent mindedness than to slag a future saint? All the virtue that Mother Teresa displayed can't be as pure as it looks, some naysayers chortle. Whatever their reasons, I'm certain they would feel different if they had seen her hands, 
as I once did during a trip to Calcutta years ago. I was working on a rural development project in southern India and had long been waiting to visit the city that seemed the essence of India in all its exotic chaos. Mother's hands, with thick, arthritic knuckles, looked as if they were made of clumps of wood and were disproportionately large for her tiny body. The weathered brown of her skin stood in contrast to the cool white of the garments worn by the sisters of the order she founded, but her hands were restless like a young person's. I remember wondering how much suffering must have seeped into those fingers. Within minutes of our having met, she commandeered me to drive her to the airport where she was to receive a shipment of donated clothing from New Delhi. You see, she said, I ask everyone for help all the time. I ask and I ask, and just when they think they've done enough or are fed up with me, I ask for more. She grinned, adding, I have no shame. It was thrilling to help her. I mean, how many times have you jumped at the chance to drive someone to the airport through some of the worst traffic in the Northern Hemisphere? It felt like God's work. Her toils were not for the faint-hearted, and she demanded absolute adherence from the sisters in the order and the volunteers in the maze of charities she ran in Calcutta. This was nowhere better illustrated than at her home for the destitute and dying. John Kennedy goes on to write, I was listening to a radio show the other day and the host asked his readers to call in with their thoughts on who was more of a saint, Mother Teresa or Princess Diana. Both women gave comfort to the poor and sick, yet their deaths affected the world so differently. How many people remember every detail of Diana's death but virtually nothing of Mother Teresa's? The sense of tragedy surrounding Diana's death made ever more acute since she was young and the mother of two children. When compared with the relatively muted response of mother's passing may perhaps reveal a truth about human nature. By the way, if you can hear the rain on my microphone, it's pouring down rain here right now and I've, I, I'm just going to keep going with it because it's incredibly fitting for this week's article. <laughs> Diana was wealthy and beautiful and had an abundance of options, yet she chose to give of herself through charitable work. That choice is admirable. But praise for Mother Teresa seems less forthcoming. Why? Is it because she was a small elderly nun whose job was doing God's work? And with the Nobel Peace Prize and the international recognition, she made out pretty well, right? We diminish the choice she made, perhaps because she did not seem as human as Diana, as tempted by other options. What I saw was that by sheer force of will, she was able to transform the lives not just of the poor whom she aided, but of the rich whom she relentlessly solicited. Call me crazy, but I've never seen one person provoke as many small acts of kindness from strangers. The three days I spent in her presence was the strongest evidence this struggling Catholic has ever had that God exists. Moving on to the main article I wanted to highlight today, the article about Princess Diana. This is called The Lady Vanishes, which I thought was an interesting way of describing what happened to her. The Lady Vanishes. The People's Funeral for Diana, Princess of Wales, a visual essay by British photographer Platon. Sorry if I said that wrong. With reflections and reminiscences by a friend, a tabloid editor, and others. So these are just stories that people shared of Diana, and obviously the pictures are very telling of how much she meant to everyone. The people's loss. There are stages to death and bereavement that relate to every loss. For example, there is a tremendous amount of anger, and this has been displaced onto the paparazzi and the drunk driver. There's a worldwide depression as a result of Diana's death, evident in the number of flowers that have been placed by the people at the royal residences and British consulates worldwide. Bargaining with God doesn't apply here because there is no use bargaining. God has taken her already. The stages of dying and grief include denial. The media attention will keep our denial going for a long time. With so many programs showing footage of Diana, it may be difficult for the public to ever get through this stage. The People's Party Girl Once, I remember Diana came to the royal premiere of The Prince of Tides. Barbara Streisand joined us in the balcony at the theater. After the film, as the princess and I were walking out, it was usual for everyone to stand until the princess was out of the theater. But before we had left the balcony, there were cries of Barbara, Barbara from Streisand's fans in the seats in the orchestra. Instead of leaving, the princess said, let's stay and watch this. Streisand stood over the balcony with her arms outstretched, talking to her fans. It was like a scene from Evita. The princess was riveted by the moment. In July 1996, she rang me early in the morning and said, I'm giving you my clothes for the AIDS Crisis Trust. Half the proceeds were to go to a London infirmary for cancer patients. Later in the week, she decided to ask Christie's to auction her royal gowns in New York. For the sale, we stayed at the Carlisle Hotel. It was like a dormitory since we were all on the same floor with a few other friends. She would run over into my room and look through my clothes or watch my makeup being done. She did take her work seriously. She was never frivolous about that. She may have still felt insecure, 
but she certainly acted more confident than she had 10 years earlier when I first met her. She was more sure-footed. I feel like I've lost my best playmate. That was written by Marguerite Littman. She was the founder of the AIDS Crisis Trust. The People's Protector. I have given many people tours of minefields, including Anthony Lake, Madeleine Albright, and Ethel Kennedy, who practically fainted and ran away when a mine was pointed out to her. The princess was the first person I've taken to a minefield who actually seemed relaxed. In fact, and this is funny, it amused her to be there because she could be sure there were no photographers lurking in the bushes. It's amazing that she had to walk into a minefield to get away from the photographers. She was clearly a little nervous when I took her down a lane and pointed out a mine. That had a bit of an effect on her. You could see it in her face. One authorized photographer asked her to crouch over the mine and point at it, and she said, No, thank you. That's not going to happen. This is quite close enough. That was by Richard Bolter of the Halo Trust. The People's Amusement. When an executive read out the morning news list at the Daily Mirror, he treated Diana as he would politics or crime. She was a category, an event, a key part of the tabloid agenda. When I took the job as editor, I understood the importance of Diana as a guaranteed seller. We sold more copies whenever we featured pictures and stories about her. Under these circumstances, it was perhaps natural, if foolhardy, that Diana, isolated in her marriage and feeling marginalized by the rest of the royal family, should try to win good publicity through the mass market papers. She was frustrated by the way in which press secretaries of both Prince Charles and the Queen failed to give straight answers, leading to speculation being presented as fact. Stories were officially denied after publication, never before. As her marriage fell apart, Diana encouraged friends to speak to reporters. She posed alone in front of the Taj Mahal to illustrate her separation from her husband. She persuaded friends to talk to a correspondent who was writing a book about her. Diana had fallen into the trap of colluding with the very newspapers that made her life a misery. It was a habit she never kicked. That was written by Roy Gleanslade, the former editor of London's Daily Mirror. Next story is called The People's Obsession. In the late 50s, Rome was one of the capitals of cinema, and American actors and actresses came here to work at the famous studio Cinecitta. With the arrival of foreign stars, new professions were created, including hordes of press photographers. Some stayed out all night long at the doors of the famous hotels to await the return of an actress who hadn't slept there, or who was coming back with a man who wasn't her husband. Federico Fellini called one of these photographers paparazzo in his film La Dolce Vita. The word didn't mean anything, but I found it very funny, and it conveyed what we Italians called siotroneria, something that one has affection for, yet also finds pitiful. That was our last story written by Pinelli, who co-wrote La Dolce Vita. There's a lot of speculation about Princess Diana and the mystery surrounding her death. There's been a ton of documentaries made, and I'll admit, when her death happened, I was very young and just, I, I knew what had happened, but I didn't understand exactly what, what really happened. So I'm kind of peeling back those layers and re-teaching myself what happened, and I'm putting my own intelligence into it and making my own assertions. What do you all think? Share your thoughts in the comments and let me know. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. If you haven't yet subscribed, please do so. Go back and watch some of the old videos that I've already created. Like I said, this is episode 13, so there's 12 other episodes you definitely need to get caught up on. Recently, I asked 107 his thoughts on George Magazine, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised by his response that he has every single copy with notes. I thought that was really cool. So thank you, Juan, for sharing your thoughts of George Magazine. and. Um, I'll be interested to hear what Juan has to say when he pulls those magazines out and we can maybe do a show just on George magazines. That does it for today's show. Thanks again for watching. I hope you all have a great week and I'll see you next time. Magazine, George, which is a hoot of a magazine. I thought you were a lawyer. I was. What happened? Well, we uh, we decided, I mean, actually taking a cue from, from folks like yourself and you around the 1992 election, that, that there was an opportunity here to uh, change the definition of a political magazine. Uh, certainly the way Americans were uh, accessing information about politics and politicians was changing. Uh, candidates were appearing on late night talk shows, on talk radio, on sitcoms. Uh, 
and there was a, a kind of a leveling process and while the rest of media clearly had caught up with that we felt that political magazines per se hadn't your mother was a hell of an editor at Doubleday that's what I hear would she have liked George I think she would have